In this first one, we're, what or this season, these next five weeks, um, well, next six weeks, uh, counting today, uh, we just took the theme of knowing God and uh, tried to look at what are some different ways in which we um, experience the the reality of knowing God. And so each week, one of our elders is going to teach on a different aspect. So I drew today and um, under the topic of knowing God in the gospel of the kingdom. And so uh, that's what we'll be looking at um, today. The other ones are going to be knowing God in revelation, uh, knowing God in scripture, knowing God in his nature in terms of the Trinity, knowing God through his acts, and then We'll have the final one will be a conversation uh, on our efforts in evangelism. So each week, and I know people are coming and going and, and uh, during the summer, but you'll have a, just a little bit of a sense of um, the, the topic that will be uh, being discussed. So knowing God in the gospel of the kingdom, um, let me just, and I've given a handout if you want to follow in that way. If you don't want to, you just want to listen, that's fine. Um, I left... Um, some things blank uh, for some people that love to fill in stuff, and um, it also makes you feel like you're doing something rather than staring at a piece of paper that's already been written out for you. Um, but um, let's begin with a question. <coughs> How does a person come to know someone else? Just answer whatever comes to mind. How does a person come to know, huh? Conversations, okay? Okay, activities together, experiences. Huh? Common interests? What's that? Okay, reputation. Yeah, you, you, you develop reputation. Okay, time spent together. Good. Um, what are some ways that we use the phrase, uh, I know them? Okay, good. Uh, you get me, you kind of understand me. Do we use it that way? I know them in a vague way? You can, can't you? Some, oh, yeah, I know them. Yeah, sometimes you can use it, and it's a very minimal amount of knowledge. All right? Other ways? Okay, sometimes we just know about them. Any other other things? Say again. Okay, which would require what? Some deeper knowledge, right? Yeah. Okay, there's a range, right? Of of when we use the phrase in English, I know them. Context tells you what are you talking about and how you're meaning that. We can say it in a very um, simple way, oh, I know them, meaning I know who you're talking about. Or we can say, I know them, I really know them, I, I know what they would do in a given situation, or um, I know uh, them intimately. And so there's a range that, that we use that phrase. Um, what is necessary to know a person? And I'm talking about really know them. What's necessary? Time? Time? Okay, share. Who has to share? Yeah, isn't that interesting? A uh, little illustration. If you go into a coffee shop and um, you go, let's say you go to the same coffee shop, same day, uh, same time, three, four, five times a week, all right, and someone else kind of doing the same thing, and so you've begun to notice they're here, same time I'm here. Uh, do you know them? To a degree, oh, I, you know, you see them, what would it take in order for you to actually know them would be their words, right? You have to sit down and have a conversation. And so um, part of 
uh, knowing somebody is, is their word. That, that's, somebody said, conversation, you know. A word enables you to begin to know. Now, one of the problems with people is that we keep secrets, right? So we only allow people to see and know what we want them to know, right? There's a, we're always doing this thing about how much am I going to divulge and how much I'm not going to divulge. And so there, in knowing someone, there is a great deal about knowing someone is the willingness of that individual to open up their life to you. And, on, and you can only know them to the degree that they're willing to open their lives up to you. You cannot push past that degree. In other words, self-revelation demands, and, and really knowing somebody, it's up to that individual, not up to you. And so I, I start here because uh, in Psalm 9, verse 10, it says, and those who know your name will put their trust in you. Those who know your name will put their trust in you. So what is that verse, when we think about knowing someone, what does that verse tell us about the knowledge of God or knowing God? Well, one thing it tells us is that um, the name, the idea of a name, especially when we think about God, is that a name is personal. See, if the nature of God is a force or a, an entity or, you know, whatever, that there's no name there. But the fact that, that God has a name and, of course, reveals his name means that he's personal. So that's one thing. The second thing is, is that if the, it says, and those who know your name put their trust in you, means that God is willing to utterly open himself up and self-disclose how far, how far has God been willing to do that? See, if you look at your human, our human relationships, you look at your life, you're willing to go thus far and no further um, with certain people, even with your spouse, whom you're the closest to, you may still find spots where you are not revealing, re willing or haven't revealed some pieces of your life, whether intentionally or unintentionally. And so um, to know someone always is dependent on the other individual being willing to disclose themselves. And so when you think about this verse, Psalm 910, those who know your name will put their trust in you. How can you put your trust? The only way that you can possibly put your trust in God is if he is willing uh, to really make himself vulnerable, to really make himself known. And so... Uh, I, I just, it's very helpful for me, and I'm just sharing some of this help for me to understand that principle and understand what has God done in order to make himself known so that we can put our trust in him. And, um, you know, one of the things important, I think, to recognize is that um, God did not give us an argument for his existence or for relationship with him, right? He, he, when, when God self-disclosed, he doesn't give us an argument to show us that he's there. What does he do? Huh? I am, but what's the doctrine of the incarnation, God becoming one of us, he gave us a person. See, a person you can know, an argument, that's abstract, that's, you know, outside of you, that's just information, but a person you could know. And so when you think about Jesus coming into the world and being, first of all, he came as a person. Secondly, how, how much was he willing to disclose of himself and open up? So, you know, absolutely everything. And so you begin to see, uh, first of all, just trying to lay this foundation of what does it take to know someone? And then secondly, what, what did God do in order for us to know him would be to recognize he doesn't give us 10, you know, 10 facts or an argument or whatever for his existence uh, or his reality, but rather comes himself as a person so that we can actually know him. Um, so, um, 
Jesus said in John 17, this is eternal life that you may, what? You may know that, what does he follow that? That you may, yeah. Yeah, this is eternal life. Now, when you think of eternal life, what do you typically think of? Huh? Life forever. Normally, in our general thinking, when we think of eternal life, we think of everlasting life, life forever, never-ending life. But Jesus says that the essence of eternal life is knowledge of God. This is eternal life, that you may know him and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. And so the moment that you enter into the knowledge of God through Jesus Christ, whom he has sent, that's the moment that eternal life is present. It's not because life ends, doesn't ever end. It's because God himself is eternal. And so if you come into relationship with that, you get connected to that, then by definition, you have to live forever because that's his nature. And so, um, uh, so if, if, in fact, then, that this is eternal life, that they may know you, the only true, true God and Jesus Christ whom we've sent, what would be the most important thing about our lives then would be what? To know God, to have the knowledge of God, to, to be wrapped up in that. That would be the pursuit of our life. If that's what eternal life is, then that would be preeminent over everything else is the knowledge of God, the experience of, of, of who he is. Now, when Jesus began his ministry then, okay, I'm trying to lead us down some steps here. When Jesus began his ministry then, what was his opening line? Huh? <laughs> okay, if you're looking on your paper, repent for the kingdom of God is at hand, all right? Repent for the kingdom of God is at hand. Uh, Matthew puts it that way, repent for the kingdom of God is hand. Mark puts it this way, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God is at hand. Repent and believe the gospel. All right, and then Luke, interestingly, kind of uh, comes at it, break, breaks from Matthew and Mark and comes at it from a different angle. And he says, the, Jesus' introduction in Luke, you know, his, his opening ministry after the baptism and the uh, temptation narratives, both Matthew and Mark say that then Jesus went about and preached, repent, for kingdom have had at hand. But Luke says, and, and you know, there's, there's not competition here, but Luke puts Jesus in Nazareth and says that the, the opening line of his ministry was, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor he has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, and to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Now, I'm trying to help us see, to put, put those two together. Knowing God, then, is packaged in, wrapped up, the wrapper, the package, is in the reality of the kingdom of God, which is dawning in the coming of this one who is making God known, all right? So for Jesus, his whole um, way in which he goes about this idea of knowing God and actually being in relation to God is captured in or wrapped up in the idea of the kingdom. Now, in um, American life and teaching and um, practice um, for decades, uh, the typical version of American kind of teaching has been that salvation is about trusting Jesus and dying and going to heaven, or die, uh, and when you die, you go to heaven. Like, if, if you thought about over the past 50, 60, maybe 80 years, maybe, I don't know, some, that the, the essence of, of the message was make sure that you know Jesus so that when you die, you'll go to heaven. And, and that's true. There's truth to that. But when Jesus starts talking about knowing God, 
It's all packaged in the language of, and it's wrapped up in the language of the kingdom. To know God, is ha you, in order to know God, you have to know something about the kingdom. And you have to be able to understand what he's bringing. If you don't understand what he's bringing, there's just, just it, you're, you're missing gigantic pieces of what it means to know God. And so I, I'm trying to move us, get us to be able to see knowing God means knowing a person. It's, it's that person disclosing themselves to us. And when Jesus begins to do it, he does it by saying that the kingdom of God is at hand. So in order to begin to look at this, um, there's a simple outline that I think is helpful and, uh, when you look at the whole Bible, and that is um, God tells us what he's going to do. God does it. God explains what he did, right? Old Testament, God tells us what he's going to do. Gospels, God does it. Uh, Acts to the end of the book, uh, God uh, tells us what that, what he did, okay? And so we're just going to follow that simple outline for the purposes of our discussion uh, and thinking about this idea of knowing, knowing God. So let's think about the Old Testament, okay? And remember the, the theme here is knowing God in the gospel of the kingdom, okay? And so in the Old Testament kingdom, uh, there are three parts to it that are helpful to, to remember. One is uh, the kingdom is God's people in God's place under God's rule, all right? Uh, and I, if you wanted three Ps, I'd put it there under God's plan. But it's really under God's rule, okay? So God's people in God's place under God's rule. And so when we think about the Old Testament, um, uh, the Old Testament speaks in terms of, especially the kingdom of God is not, uh, it's, somebody has said, you know, the, the Old Testament is, um, well, yeah, the Old Testament is, is concealed and it's revealed in the New Testament, okay? So when you think about Old Testament, the, God, the Old Testament speaks in terms of all kinds of imagery. And so what I've selected is just about four or five uh, things that are imagery in the Old Testament that help us grasp the idea of the kingdom in the Old Testament, and then we'll look at the Gospels, and then we'll look at the, um, the uh, uh, New Testament, or, or after the Gospels. So the Bible opens up in what? what? What's the opening scene? Okay, creation, but there's a particular th place. Okay, the garden, all right, the garden. So imagery of garden is very important in the whole Bible, and it begins in the very first place. So in the garden, let's just apply those, that idea of kingdom, God's place, God's people under God's rule. Who in the, what in, in the garden, who were the people of God? Adam and Eve, very good. And uh, what was um, the place? The garden itself, right? Okay, so God's people, Adam and Eve, in God's place, the garden. And what was the plan or the, the word under which they were to be? Fellowship with God, but there was some specifics about what you were supposed to do there, right? Okay, tend the garden have dominion, you're free to do eat any of the trees of the fruit in the, in the garden, <laughs> except for one, all right, there was one prohibition in that whole scene, that whole, it was all this stuff they're supposed to do, but there was one prohibition, so here you have the, in the garden theme, in the, in the imagery of garden, okay, God's people in God's place under God's rule, all right, now let's take the, of course, then the fall happens, all right, just the fact that there was the disobedience, and after the disobedience, the removal from the garden, and then you had, you know, the, the disruption in God's world, and the rebellion, and then as a result of that, the curse that falls, you know, and so you got death, and alienation, and all these things, the relational breakdown, all that stuff that happens, and then Genesis 3.15, you have this promise that God is going to undo what just happened, but it's going to take time. You know, there's going to be this person that's going to come, and he's going to bruise the heel of the serpent, and then this, uh, excuse me, he's going to crush the head of the serpent, and the, and the serpent will, will bruise his heel. All right, so all that happens. Now, let's go to the next image. Okay, we're jumping. All right, land. 
Okay, land is very important in the Old Testament. Uh, um, God makes a promise about land. So, who were God's people? When you think about the imagery of land, okay, and there's a promise to Abraham. Who were God's people? Yeah, people of Israel, be a little bit more specific. The family of who? The family of Abraham is the people of God in where? Canaan, yeah. The land of promise is the space. It's the place. It's God's place. All the other nations, though they exist and though they're they're not getting any of the blessings or any of the rules or any of the revelation that God is making. Paul says in Acts 17 that that uh, God overlooked the sins of them for, you know, of all these other nations for decades, but now he's calling you to repent, all right, Acts, Acts 17. But so the land is uh, a critical place. It's God's people in God's place under what? What was the rule? Yeah, the Mosaic law, okay? The Mosaic law is God's revelation. This is how my family, family of Abraham, is supposed to behave, is supposed to operate. It's supposed to work. All right, so so there you have that. All right, and in Genesis 12, 1 to 3, I'm going to make you in a great nation. I'm going to bless you. You're going to be a blessing to all the families of the earth. Okay, and under the Mosaic law, there were both blessings and curses, right? If you obey, God's, God's going to bless you. If you disobey, then you're going to be, God's going to uh, punish you, and he's going to drive you out of the land, which happened. All right, so land. Let's take another image, temple. Okay, same exercise. In temple imagery, okay, in the land, you had this central location called the temple. Who were God's people in the temple? It gets a little more specific. Priests of the tribe of Levi, the Levitical tribe, they were the people who ministered in the, in the temple. You're not in the tribe of Levi, you can't minister to, in, in the temple. All right, and what was God's place there? Okay, holy, holy, or you could just say the whole temple itself, essentially, you know, the, the inner core would have been the holy of holies. And what would have God's, God's rule in the temple? Yeah, the sacrificial system. Here's how you are to do and what you are to do. Okay, and so, and, and the promise in the temple was if you... Uh, operate under this, what would God do there? Huh? Yeah, well, and especially in, in Numbers, God says, I will meet with you there. So God's going to meet with his people in this special location that God selects. It starts out in the tabernacle, later it's, uh, it's um, localized in Jerusalem after the building of the temple. All right, let's take another image. King and city. King and city. All, all of these are very important if you don't, because we'll see, we'll see why, how important these are. But let's, king and city. All right. Who are God's people in the kingship and in the city? What city is important? Jerusalem. All right. Who was God's people? Yeah, David and his descendant, the line of David. Very important, okay? And what was his place? No. The Jerusalem itself, right? The city is the place, right, where, where God has established. He says, I'm going to put the temple in the place of my choosing, right? And so he selects Jerusalem out of all the land. Jerusalem is the place that he chooses, and that's where he's going to be, and that's also where the king is. And out of the city of Jerusalem will come blessing, okay, for the nation, and then ultimately later it's going to come blessing for, for the whole world. All right, and what was the plan or the rule for the king and the city? Pardon me? Yes, and what was the king supposed to do? Whenever he, when the new king came in, what was he supposed to do? Pardon me? Yeah, but actually every king was supposed to make a copy of the law. Right? Why was he supposed to do that? His own personal copy so that he would remember it and they would not lose it. Does that happen? 
a lot of them don't do it. In fact, you know, the one part, you know, they, they've totally lost the, the law. They don't know where the law is until it's discovered, you know. So, so the king is supposed to make a copy of the law for his own self so that he will know what his responsibility is. And under that, then supposed to rule, God is the king, and he's ruling through this king on earth. You know, David's uh, Psalm 2, this is, you know, all Psalm 2. Um, he's supposed to be ruling under, uh, as, as God's chosen son under God on earth, and he's supposed to then rule in righteousness and justice. Okay, and of course, the history of Israel is a mess, of course, because uh, so many kings don't rule in righteousness and justice. Every so often you get one, and he does it to a certain extent. And um, uh, so, so you have, you see that. And if he rules in righteousness and justice, the law said that God would, it would be fruitful. His, 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 his uh, kingship would be fruitful and there would be blessing. All right, one last image. The prophetic word. All right. So thinking about the, the prophets, who would be God's people in this? The prophets themselves, okay, God raises up prophets and they're to speak. Um, and you probably could also make a case that not only the prophets themselves individually, but the remnant who believes the word, the revealed word, or who believes, responds in faith to the, that prophetic word. All right, and where would, where, what was God's place? This is a little harder, right? It's a little, little less clear. What were the prophets pointing towards? All right, they're constantly saying, you know, God's going to bring judgment because of your disobedience, but in, in the midst of that judgment, there's going to be a rescue, a deliverer, a remnant, a preservation of those who believe. And so you've got this kind of looking forward to someday God is going to fulfill through some unique individual, this uh, restoration, after God brings judgment, there's going to be restoration. So, so many of the prophets are constantly this theme of judgment and restoration, right? So, they're making you look forward to the saver, savior, the deliverer who would bring healing, okay? And then, lastly, uh, 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 under God's plan would be this savior deliverer who would bring who would bring healing. So under prophets, you've got the prophets themselves and the faithful remnant. The new Jerusalem that will come, and this Davidic king that they're announcing, and then lastly um, that they would they would be a, be a savior deliverer who would bring healing and restoration, not only to the city itself but to the nation, and then not only to the nation, but it would spill over so grand, in such a grand way that all the nations of the world would be included in it. So you get this long prophetic hope, okay? All right, let's move on then to uh, what is, so that's what God did, uh, excuse me, that's what God said he would do, okay? Now let's think under the terms of uh, what God did. Uh, all right, in the gospel, who is the people of God? Huh? Okay. Think in terms of what God said he would do. Now we're in under God, what God did. Okay. So actually in the gospel, the people of God is Jesus himself. Now, why would I say that? Okay, why would we just say the people of God is just Jesus and, and we're not talking yet about those who believe in him? Because in Matthew chapter, uh, very beginning of Matthew, what do we see? The prophet, he's saying that Jesus uh, was called out of, where? Out of Egypt, all right? He's called out of Egypt and he says, the prophetic word is that I called my son out of Egypt, Okay. Uh, Jesus goes into the, into the um, wilderness, and he's there how many days? Forty days. And what's happening in the wilderness? Being, tempt being tempted. And what does he do in response to that? 
He, he obeys, okay? And Israel did what in the wilderness? Sinned <laughs> and didn't obey, right? Okay, so the, the writers are trying to get us to see that Jesus is the true Israel, the true son of God, because Israel is called what? The son. You will be my son. The whole client, clan, the whole uh, family, you will be my son. Out of Egypt, I called my son. And that applied to Israel. But in the Gospels, they're trying to, the writers are trying to get us to see that Jesus is doing what Israel never did. Okay? He is called out of Egypt as a son. He goes into the, um, he goes into the uh, um, wilderness and he is tempted and he is obedient and he doesn't capitulate in any way and he's faithful. And therefore, he is the true Israel. He is the son of God. Okay, that's what the writers are trying to get us to see. And if you don't grasp that, then you don't begin to see how your life, that he's your, he's your representative, right? Adam in the garden did what as the representative? Blew it, okay, and entered in sin and death. Jesus comes in, in Romans chapter 5, and he becomes the what? The second Adam, the second representative. He's the representative, right? And he's the true son. He's the true people of God. He's the real Israel. He's the real deal. And so in the gospel itself, in the, in, in the, the, the immediate, we'd call this gospel proper, he is the true son, the true is, he's the people of God. And if you don't understand that, you won't be able to understand how when you come to faith and you get included in him, that all the rights and privileges that he won for you become yours. See, so uh, he's the true Israel, he's the true son of God. Now, let's bring all that imagery, okay, land, garden, temple, um, the prophetic word, all of that imagery, and think about Jesus, okay? In John chapter 2, he says, they, you know, he, he cleanses the temple, and they say, you know, what sign are you going to give to us for why you're doing these things, and what is his response? Tear down this temple, and three days I'll raise it again. What is, and, G, and then John comments to that, and he says, but he was speaking about his body. Now, what John is saying is that Jesus is the true what? Temple. He's replacing the temple. That the t physical temple was an anticipatory thing that Jesus would, would be, um, the anticipatory thing, a meeting with God. Well, now where do we meet with God? In Jesus, see. So he is the temple. The imagery is trying to get us to recognize that was to anticipate that this one would come, all right? So he's the meeting place, the new temple. Uh, the priesthood, right? Hebrews, he's the new priest, or he is the ultimate priest, or he is the true priest. So the priesthood was an anticipation that there would someday come a priest who wouldn't offer the blood and bulls and goats that can't that can't cleanse from sin, that can't touch the you know they're temporary, they can't cleanse the conscience. And so he's the priesthood. He is the sacrifice. So he's not only the priesthood, but he's a sacrifice. He is the entrance into the Holy of Holies. Uh, garden, let's think about the theme of garden. Okay, in the garden, Adam and Eve did what? Obeyed or disobeyed? Disobeyed. Jesus also goes into a garden. Obeyed or disobeyed? Obeyed. So he is the access into the garden, you see. Uh, so he's the true son of David when he comes into Jerusalem and, and in, uh, on the triumphal entry, what, he's presenting himself as the true son of David. Um, he's the true prophet in the fulfillment of the prophet's word. He's the savior, the deliverer that all of these things are pointing towards. And so, who is the people of God in the gospel? It's Jesus. What is God's place? Him. He is the place because all of this imagery is fulfilled in him. It's him. And then lastly, uh, what is God's, under God's rule or plan would be the healing of the nations, all that he's going to bring the new Jerusalem, the new heavens and the new earth. And this is why Jesus, when he 
says at the end of his ministry, he says, go now and preach the gospel beginning where? In Jerusalem. And then where? Judea, Samaria. And then to where? To the ends of the earth, right? Because this kingdom message is going to go beyond the land of Israel to all the nations. So in the gospel, that's what we have. Now, I have to add one little thing here. Um, the kingdom comes in stages. So in the first coming, we have the announcement that the kingdom has arrived. Uh, Mark chapter 10, the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve and give his life as a ransom for many. Um, very, very different than what the people anticipated, of course. Uh, Jesus, as I've already mentioned, he lives as a representative of his people. He, 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 his life, he obeys for them. His death, he dies in their place to pay the penalty. Um, he rises again in the resurrection to show that the debt has been paid and that, um, that uh, eternal life is available. Um, and so then what's the message? Going all the way back to what he said at the beginning, what? Repent and believe in the gospel, what God has done. Repent and believe. This is the kingdom that God is achieving and, 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 and completing and bringing into reality. And the first coming is concealed. Um, it's... Um, that's one of the things you know about the nature of the of his kingdom is is that it comes in a very seed like form, like we talked several weeks ago, right? About the when take care how you hear, because the gospel comes as a what, as a seed, and so the first coming is very concealed. It's 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 not con didn't come with the with the uh, power. It didn't come with the visibility. It didn't come with all the expectation that all of the the, the anticipation that it would heal everything, and that's why people had such a hard time with it. So it comes in two stages. First coming, coming to achieve salvation and to make that salvation available. Second coming to do, to reveal the fullness of that uh, kingdom. So the second coming is the unveiling. It's the, um, the revealing of the glory of Jesus. And so you have all these other things that come as a result in the second in the second coming. Okay, uh, we're running really close on time here, so let me try to wrap up here. Now, let's think just briefly about what God God tells us what He's going to do. God did it. Now God tells us what He did. Okay, so because of the gospel. So I said at the beginning in the gospel, who's the kingdom of God in the gospel? Jesus. Because of the gospel. As a result of the gospel, who are the people of God? Everybody who puts their faith in Jesus as their Savior King. You know, 1 Peter, we, we covered, um, and um, in 1 Peter 2, he says, but you are a what? A chosen people, okay? A royal priesthood, a holy nation. So everybody who puts their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ, then is God's people. And where or what is God's place then now? It is. It's in our hearts, kingdom in here. But, it, but you could also make the case it's the church. It's the people of God. Who are the people of God? Those who have put their faith in him. They're in Christ. And because they're in Christ, the people of God now is the church. Now, I'm not saying, by saying that, if you're kind of sharp here at this moment, that God is altogether done with Israel. All right? So, by saying that, I'm not saying that there is no other plan that God has for Israel. I still think that there is something for Israel. That's a very complicated conversation. But, just to say, the New Testament writers, when they apply the Old Testament, they apply that to the church. Peter does it. First Peter 2, 9 to 10 are, is a prime, prime example where he speaks about, you are the people of God. You are a holy nation. You are a royal priesthood. That's all Old Testament language. And so um, we see that the, the people of God in the New Testament are, are those who put their faith in him, in him. And then, uh, and that is 
present in the world right now in the form of the church. I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. That's what Jesus is doing. Okay, so the kingdom of God is advancing and he has given us this thing called the church to enable us to be able to survive in a, in a very dark world. And then lastly, what would be God's plan as a result of that or in the, in the church? We just did it this morning. How did we end the service? The new covenant, right? This, the under now, what are we under? Are we under the old covenant? No. Jesus has fulfilled it. We're under the new covenant. This is, my, is this the covenant in my blood? And so the, um, the reality of what Jesus has accomplished for us is now being, is now ours. It belongs, everything that belongs to him belongs to us. us. And so um, this is the new covenant in Jesus' blood. Of course, the word of God itself and it's Jesus as the head of the church, okay? Uh, so, what is then in this in-between time after Jesus ascends and before he comes again, what's supposed to happen in that time? What is Jesus doing right now? Huh? He's building his church. The kingdom of God is advancing. All right, we're a part of that. Go, therefore, make disciples of all nations. And what are we supposed to be preaching? Two things. The forgiveness of sins, okay? Right, and, and because of that, the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's fascinating to me that the disciples preach. He says, you know, that the, the, they ask him, Lord, are you going to restore the kingdom now? And he says, that's not for you to know. Right now, what I want you to do in this in-between time is um, the Holy Spirit will come upon you in power and you'll be my witnesses, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. And forgiveness of sins will be preached. And so what do they, what, in the book of Acts, what do they go about doing? Preaching the cross and the resurrection over and over again. That's what Jesus did. Cross and the resurrect, cross and resurrect. Why? Because that's the entrance into the kingdom. That's how people get in. That's how we discover God's grace and favor is he comes into our lives through the preaching of the cross and the resurrection. And because of that, forgiveness of sins. And you get two gifts. You get the gift of forgiveness and you get the gift of the Holy Spirit. So, to conclude, four things. What does it mean for us knowing God, getting back to what we talked about at the beginning? How do we know God in the gospel of the kingdom? Four things. Number one, knowing God is a matter of personal dealing. Um, it's more than knowing about him or being able to have conversation about him, talking about like we talked about today. It's more than words. It's being drawn into a personal relationship uh, with him because he's opened himself up to you. God has totally exposed himself, totally make him, made himself vulnerable by becoming a man dying on a cross with his arms spread open. Um, so it's a matter of personal dealing. Number two, knowing God is a matter of personal commitment. Um, to get to know someone, you have to commit yourself to them. And uh, if you try to retain the rights over your life and hold back, there can be no knowing of that. There can be no true knowing because it's all going to be one-sided. Number three, knowing God is a matter of grace. Um, somebody said, we don't make friends with God. God makes friends with us. He came and pursued us. We would never go looking after God. We would never pursue God. Our hearts are desperately wicked. They tricky places. They pursue our own interests. You know, unless God came looking for us, we would never go looking for him. Paul says in Galatians 4, he says, now that you have come to know God, and then he says, you remember what comes next? Or rather, become, have come to be known by God. Um, and so, knowing God is a matter of grace. And then fourth, Knowing God is a matter of healing. Um, it's understanding that God is engaged in a monumental work to heal the world. 
And in the process, he will heal you and me if we're willing to be caught up in what he's doing. Um, and um, to be healed, we'll have to submit to the healing that he provides and not try to come up with our own plan for how, to, how that would be. And so knowing God in the gospel of the kingdom is understanding this grand thing, this monumental work that God has put into motion and that he has accomplished, and um, we can know him personally. Now, each week from here, we'll kind of try to take some additional steps in terms of knowing God in the scriptures, in nature, revelation, um, and in some of the other uh, areas in terms of his nature um, and his acts. So, But just to get us started, we think about knowing God, this kind of like a big flyover over the whole Bible. Um, we can just kind of get a sense of the grandeur of what he's up to and that your story my story can be written into his story and um, in that we can know him okay any comments or questions before I close with prayer all right let's pray father um, I just in a way if we just step back and look at what you're doing, we can see just glimpses of the greatness of this work. And Lord, we're amazed that we, we of all people would be included. Um, and so would you make these things real to us that we might come to know you deeply, not just from afar, but up close and personal. And might we rejoice in that um, and I pray that it would get a hold of us in new and fresh ways. Um, I pray that it wouldn't be stale and old and worn out and used. But Lord, again, would you refresh the greatness of our salvation? What should we do if we neglect so great a salvation? Help us in that, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.